Well, good evening, men. Um, it's hard to believe that we are in the third week of a significant change in our lives. We're all now working from our homes. We're using video conferencing uh, for meetings. We're having to limit our trips to grocery stores and we're all social distancing from each other. So I just wanna give you a heads up that uh, tonight's uh, lecture is gonna run a little bit longer. And I'm, uh, I came across a virtual um, hymn in Christ, your, uh, Christ Alone. And so I'm gonna share that with us and then we'll get into the lecture tonight. you enjoyed that and I hope that the uh, the sound uh, came across uh, reasonably well um, let me just get the PowerPoint organized <laughs> 
So if you go to YouTube, um, you can search the David Wesley Virtual Choir, and apparently they've got several, but I just thought that uh, it'd be nice if we started tonight's lecture uh, with that hymn. So I'm sure that most of you are like uh, my wife and I, we are trying to keep up with the news the best we can, especially the briefings uh, from the doctors with the CDC so that we're aware of um, what our responsibilities are as uh, citizens and, and good neighbors. But we're all hearing a lot of uh, catchphrases these days. 15 days to slow the spread. Do your part to slow the spread. Social distancing will flatten the curve. Now, the point of catchphrases is for them to stick with us. What's Nike's catchphrase? Just do it. How about M&M's? Melt in your mouth, not in your hands. And how about Coca-Cola's? The real thing. Now, we had a vibrant discussion on our Zoom meeting Friday morning uh, as we discussed Paul's singular focus despite any circumstance that he found himself in to share the gospel. He listened and met people where they were, always connecting them to God's word and to Jesus. Paul's courage, boldness, and intentional focus is just amazing. So when we think about this week's passages, what would Paul's catchphrase be? As we all consider <clears throat> what Paul had been going through in the last chapters of Acts, persecution, false accusations, being arrested, put in the chains, put in jail. We can only imagine the range of human emotions that he was experiencing. But thankfully, Paul was calm, confident, and a faithful witness to Jesus and his good news, which provides us with our big idea. Followers of Jesus are called to be witnesses of his good news. Now, Paul, Paul's personal experience with God was the source of his confidence and courage in sharing the gospel. Meeting the risen Jesus on the road to this Ma Damascus, he personally experienced the quote-unquote real thing. God himself was Paul's source of courage and confidence in sharing the gospel. Last week in chapter 23, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. So Paul continues to do, to just do it. His life is transformed by Jesus, and he was determined to make sure that as many people as possible had the same opportunity to experience Jesus in their lives. So regardless of the circumstances Paul was in, he understood being a faithful witness for Jesus was critical in every encounter. There was an urgency to sharing the gospel to anyone who would listen. So from our study of the Bible and your study of the Bible, what scripture verse or words could be your personal catchphrase? What would encourage you to boldly witness for Jesus and to share the good news? How about the catchphrase, <clears throat> God teaches, God teach me what I should say. Um, Jesus said, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you were about to say, uh, 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 whatever is given to you in that hour, uh, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And that was recorded in both Mark and in Matthew. We opened this year's study with Jesus' words in chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God is with us. The Holy Spirit lives within believers and he will equip us to be his witnesses. Those who are followers of Jesus should be living with intentionality, passion, focus, and courage. And sharing a bold, as boldly as Paul did when he said to Festus and King Agrippa, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today become what I am, except for these chains. Paul's heart aligned perfectly with his Lord and Savior's. He faithfully and humbly shared his personal transformation after meeting Jesus so that every person who heard his story would experience life change through a personal relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> 
we have two divisions tonight. In the first division, we see Paul, a faithful witness before Felix and Festus in Acts 24 and 25. And then uh, we see Paul, a humble witness before King Agrippa in Acts 26. So if you would, open your Bibles or your Bible apps to Acts 24, where we find Paul ending in Caesarea after a failed attempt to kill him and being escorted by a small army of Roman soldiers. Once again, we see how truth triggers opposition. The Jewish religious leaders are more interested in being right and on holding on to their corrupt enterprise cloaked beneath a false godliness. God's truth and grace exposes the sins and guilt of people. Unfortunately, some, maybe many, push back. Refusing to face their present reality, the truth about themselves, and this often leads to opposition. The Jews were relentless in their efforts to root out Paul and anyone else who threatened their status quo. So let's just take a look at some of Paul's opposition that had organized and mobilized against him before Felix. Tertullus, a skilled speaker, flatters the governor knowing full well that he was viewed as a terrible administrator with a history of hostility with the Jews. The charges against Paul that he was a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews throughout the world, that he was also the ringleader of the Nazarene cult, and in violation of Roman law, uh, Paul also tried to defile the, temp uh, the temple. They had Paul arrested and accused, and then they accused Lysias, the Roman commander of violence, knowing it was the Jews who had been on the verge of a riot. They also provided false witnesses to provide testimony against Paul. They belittled the quote-unquote way those who were followers of Jesus by describing it as a sect or a cult. They played politics with Felix with the text suggesting that he was open to settling disputes by taking bribes and making deals. Now, one theologian said, it is interesting that the three accusations range from general to particular. The first was instigating religious dissent or sedition, which was the same charge brought against Jesus and was a serious political charge, but would be hard to prove. The second being a ringleader of a sect and the third desecrating the temple a religious issue that the Romans wouldn't prosecute. Ironically, by saying that Lysias, the Roman commander, created the current incident by interfering with the work of the Sanhedrin, Tertullus was admitting that the issue was really religious, not political. The truth is that the religious, uh, Jewish religious leaders did not want Paul or anyone, for that matter, to think that they had a right to preach something contrary to what they were teaching even if it were true. The Sanhedrin was primarily interested in keeping their fellow Jews under their control. And if they were honest, they were really uh, actually jealous of Paul and his ministry because the way in its message of hope was winning the people's hearts and minds, impacting their own congregation and traditions. And there is an irony here. Paul is being falsely accused in a courtroom where in reality his accusers should have been facing charges of attempted murder, perjury, collusion, fabricating evidence, defamation, and bringing false witnesses. Paul, however, a faithful witness for Jesus, remained calm, confident, and with courage stuck to the facts and dependent on God's truth. Beginning in verse 10, we see Paul is respectful of Felix without flattery. Calmly and systematically, he lays out his defense by saying, you can easily verify that not more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove any of the charges they are now making against me. Paul then admits that he worships the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and is written in the prophets. In verse 15, I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. Paul knew this issue would be a source of contention. So he takes this opportunity to boldly affirm that his faith is based on the same faith as his fellow Pharisees. <clears throat> 
Paul knew that Roman law allowed every man to freely worship God according to the religion of their country. So with focused intention, he defends and stands up to the accusations and goes all in on his devotion to Jesus and the way. And by doing this, he essentially says, if it's a crime to love the Lord my God, then convict me. Paul was confident in his relationship with Jesus. He knew Jesus loved him and all of humanity. He was convinced that Jesus died for his sins, for the sins of all people, and was buried and had risen to life. So what does it mean for you and I to have a clear conscience before God and others? What does that look like in our life, at work, at home, and in our community? Is there a difference in how you and I demonstrate a clear conscience in our private and public life? If there is, will you join me in praying that God will give us the resolve to live with a clear conscience before him, our families, and our friends? Now, resolve means to decide firmly on a course of action, to make up one's mind, to settle on a plan of action. So let's be men that resolve to be faithful, to be prayerful, to trust and depend on God. Let's be men that will be courageous in sharing the hope we have in Jesus. Let's resolve to do what love requires of us, to respond with self-control and wisdom, and to not dwell on small matters, to resist temptations. And finally, let's resolve to persevere in being generous and gracious at all times. Beginning in verse 18, Paul is clear. There is no crowd with me, nor is I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they had anything against me. These here, who, who are here, should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it is this one thing that I shouted as I stood in your presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Now, Felix was well acquainted with the way, and so he adjourns the proceedings, saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes, I will decide your case. And he orders Paul to be kept under guard with some freedoms. In verse 24, several days later, Felix, Felix came with his wife, Trusilla, a Jewess, and they listened to Paul speak about faith in Jesus Christ. He discussed righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, at which point Felix became afraid and ended the conversation. Now, page two of the notes this week uh, will provide some additional background on Felix and Drusilla, but the bottom line is that both of them would do or say anything to get what they wanted. Now, Felix did not have a problem with the story of Jesus or the way, but when Paul's words touched the nerve about having a right relationship with God, living honorably, with integrity, and ultimately being held accountable before God, the text tells us he became afraid. Rather than coming to a place of confession and repentance, Felix wanted to avoid the message of salvation altogether until a more convenient time. Paul was given an opportunity to share the gospel. He did his part. And God also gave Felix and Drusilla the opportunity to respond, but they chose to pass for a later time. And worse, we see Felix hoping Paul would offer him a bribe, so he meets with him frequently. But when two years had passed, he was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and Felix, wanting to grant the Jews a favor, leaves Paul in prison. Now, Felix could have set Paul free because there were no grounds for charging him. But Felix was more interested in being non-confrontational with the Jews and maintaining peace. So he does nothing. He takes the easy, he takes the coward's way out. Now, that specifically touched a nerve in me, and maybe for some of you. Isn't it true that we lean towards procrastination and self-preservation, especially when we face difficult decisions or difficult topics? While juggling our busy schedules, it just seems easier to ignore or choose not to deal with important issues in our lives. The question I guess I had to ask myself and I'll ask all of us is, how is that working for us? In chapter 25, Paul is now before an inexperienced and newly appointed magistrate named Porcius Festus. 
And the Jews pick up where they left off, presenting their charges against Paul. While seeking to take advantage by urgently requesting Festive transfer Paul to Jerusalem as a favor to them, while in fact they were planning an ambush to kill him. Beginning in verse 8, Paul again courageously defends himself by stating that he has done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, asked Paul if he was willing to be tried in Jerusalem. Paul answered, saying, I am now standing in Caesar's court, where I should be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you well know. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by the Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. So I appeal to Caesar. Festus declared, after conferring with this council, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. A few days later, when King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea to pay respect to Festus, he discussed Paul's case with the king and how he was at a loss to investigate matters of dispute about the, religious, uh, the Jewish religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claims was alive. Agrippa said that he would like to hear this man himself. So we see beginning in verse 23, the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. Festus has, brought, has Paul brought in and says, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man? The whole Jewish community has petitioned me against him, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I have found that he has done nothing deserving of death, but because he appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome, but I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. It seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. So let's put ourselves in Paul's place for a moment. He's an innocent man under house arrest. It's not a dungeon, but it's two years. Two years have passed. What would you be thinking? How would you have responded? Where was Paul focused? On God. He knew God was in control, and he knew God's will for him, and that will was he was to be a witness in Rome. Paul's response to his circumstances demonstrates that he did not waste any opportunities to share the gospel. He interacted with many during those two years, including the Roman soldiers who were watching over him, the household servants of Felix and Drusilla. He had many visitors, so no time that he had was wasted while he was waiting on God. And that brings us to our first uh, main truth. God provides opportunities for his followers to courageously share the gospel. Now, many of us, if not all of us, would agree that speaking courageously about our faith is difficult and challenging. The old saying that the truth hurts rings true. While the word of God is true and is life-changing, it is also challenging. And as we discussed last week, we are called to share the whole truth, not a watered down or an easy version of the truth. Unfortunately, we all battle with fear of loss of relationships, family, and friends, and that sense of loss may cause us to omit critically important messaging the Holy Spirit wants another person to hear. To be an effective witness of the gospel, we need to be faithful, we need courage, and we need wisdom, which requires us to listen to the Holy Spirit. And by listening and observing where He is at work in the minds, in the hearts, of the people that, they, that he places before us. Our responsibility is to be prepared by studying the Bible, by exercising the knowledge God has provided. Um, we are to live as image bearers, trusting him. So let's remember the words that Paul wrote. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear, do not fear what they fear, do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. 
Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do this with gentleness, respect, and keeping a clear conscience. And I misspoke, that was actually the Apostle Peter that wrote that. In our second division uh, tonight, we're in uh, Acts 26. We see Paul as a humble witness that God has placed before King Agrippa, as well as many high-ranking officers and leading men of the city. Paul is about to give his longest speech as recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. Paul knows he will be going to Rome to face trial, yet he leverages this moment to offer a heartfelt, passionate testimony about his personal encounter and life transformation with Jesus, and to share the truth of the good news that God has for all people. King Agrippa was considered by Rome to be a small K puppet king whom they tolerated because of his knowledge of Judaism. So Paul says, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, since you are well acquainted with all Jewish customs and controversies. In verse 4, four Paul says, the Jews all know the way I lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I have lived according to the strictest stack of our religion as a Pharisee. And it is because of my hope and what God promised our fathers that I am on trial today. And then he says to the king, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? And that was the point of conflict about Israel's Messiah, their great deliverer, and in whom they had placed their hope. Paul's claim is that Jesus is the Messiah, who the Jewish leadership rejected and killed, but who God validated and vindicated by resurrecting him from the dead. In verse 9, Paul, Paul points out that he too was convinced to do all that he could to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He says, that is exactly what I did in Jerusalem. And with the authority of the chief priests, he says, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Sharing transparently, exposing not only his good, but also his shameful past, Paul hopes his audience will understand that he knows what he's talking about. He is an authority of the law and expert, yet he got it wrong. Paul is demonstrating true humility and witnessing to others. In verse 12, Paul describes his personal encounter with the risen Jesus Christ himself while on the road to Damascus, telling them that he heard a voice speaking in Aramaic say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, one theologian said to kick against the goads is only found in this account used as a metaphor for a difficult, destructive action that one simply cannot successfully resist which is the actions of God. This is the third time in Luke's narrative that Paul recounts his Damascus Road experience to present the gospel, to present the good news. He comes to realize that he and anyone who persecutes followers of Jesus are really persecuting Jesus himself. So Paul is saying, look, I was deeply committed, a knowledgeable proponent of Judaism. And yes, my perspective has changed but not in spite of Judaism, but because I now understand that our Hebrew scriptures correctly predicted Jesus coming. He has come. I met him, and he is alive. Paul continues saying that Jesus told him, get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you and appointed you a servant and a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. In verse 17, Jesus says, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn from their darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Wow, unbelievable. In this divine encounter, Paul immediately knew that the Messiah had come and the Messiah was Jesus. He knew this with certainty, and he knew that Jesus was calling him to be part of his ministry. By this time in Caesarea, Paul had written six books about his ministry experiences. 
He had a purpose. After recovering from momentary blindness, he had a fresh outlook on things and an anointing from the Lord. We can only imagine how thankful he was for the grace that God showed him and the fact that God accepted him even after all he had done to persecute Jesus and his followers. Paul reaffirms his belief in the resurrection of Jesus, for this is the very foundation of faith in Christ. Paul's hope is not focused on life on earth, because this life is only temporal. Paul now knows there is much more to life for believers in this world, because we are also citizens of heaven. Followers of Jesus have a hope now through the deliverance of bondage to our sinfulness, and we share that hope in the way we live, speak, and share with others, knowing that one day God will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like himself, in the presence of God forever, without sin, pain, disease, or suffering. Knowing this with certainty, as Paul did, should prompt us to wake up every day eager to share his good news with as many people as we can. And this needs to be with a sense of urgency so that none are lost and end up tragically being separated from God for eternity. Now, consider the response from Festus and Agrippa after they've heard all this. Festus interrupts Paul's defense saying, you're out of your mind, Paul. Your great learning is driving you crazy. Now, most of us have had this experience when someone we know doesn't take us seriously. They try to crack a joke, or to avoid the conversation or topic altogether. However, the truth is everyone needs to know the truth. Paul responds in verse 25, I'm not insane. And King Agrippa, you are familiar with these things. You know what I am saying is true and reasonable. And I know this has not escaped your notice. This has all been done in the open. And then he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. So in humility, Paul is reminding Agrippa that he knows the law. He knew about Jesus, and what he has been saying is not something new. So please, Agrippa, turn to Jesus. Repent before it's too late. The sad reality is we are not told if any of those who heard Paul's message ever received or believed in the good news of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus know that every day is a day of salvation for someone. The question is, will we be humble and transparent as we share the gospel and the hope we have in love with someone that is struggling with the pressures of expectation, past guilt, anxiety, or even loneliness? Will you and I commit to sharing our life's experiences in order to relate to someone who might be going through a similar circumstance? C.S. Lewis said, <clears throat> humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And that brings us to our second main truth. Humble witnessing includes our personal testimony and always points people to God. When Paul writes in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 3, consider ourselves better than yourselves, when, excuse me, consider others better than yourselves, he uses a verb that means to calculate. So we are to make a conscious decision to consider others better than ourselves. And one way to do that is to ask ourselves, what does lover, love require of me in this situation or with this person? When you and I have the opportunity to share the gospel, it would be very helpful to know our audience and to find areas of agreement in order to build a communication bridge that will facilitate discussion of potential differences. In so doing, we're following Jesus' example. Jesus was content to be known as a carpenter, happy to, happy to be mistaken for a gardener, and he served his followers by washing their feet. That's what love does. God has chosen and saved people to be faithful and humble witnesses to his mercy and grace. Will you and I commit ourselves to be used by God for his purposes. Now we have some, some additional content I'm gonna provide uh, in tonight's lecture as well. Uh, as you know, that next week 
uh, is Palm Sunday followed by Easter. And although we are not likely all to be gathering uh, as, as uh, we normally do with our families, certainly we still have opportunities to be in conversation with people at this um, important time of the year. So the Word in Life Study Bible had an article that was titled Audience Shaped Messages. And it, it challenged followers of Jesus to ask, do you know who, do you, excuse me, do you know who to communicate the message of Christ to different audiences that you encounter? I mean, how do we do that? How do we understand how to do that? Or do you use the same formula time after time, no matter who is listening? Lastly, do you remain silent when you have an opportunity to speak up for Christ because you simply don't know what to say? Now, Paul had no prepackaged gospel message. He varied his approach with the situation. He was aware of differences between his audiences as he was the content of his faith. So, as Acts records numerous encounters, among them we see Jews in the synagogue at Antioch. Paul reviewed and summarized the history of the Jewish faith from Hebrew scriptures. He then told how that history led to Jesus. He pointed his audience's need to accept Jesus as their Messiah and he responded to their resistance by clearly explaining the alternative. The result of that conversation was many chose to follow the way of Christ, others reacted negatively and actually opposed Paul, and then we see troublemakers incited city leaders to persecute Paul and his companions. Next up in Acts 17, we see intellectuals at Athens. Paul prepared by observing and reflecting on their culture. He addressed them on their own turf, the Areopagus. He established common ground, starting with the familiar and, and what was meaningful to them. He bridged to a description of God as creator and sustainer of life, distinguishing him from the pagan idols they were worshiping. He challenged them to repentance and appealed to the resurrection of Christ as proof that what he said was true. The result, some mocked him, some wanted to hear more, and some believed. Next up in uh, Acts 21 to 22, we see an angry mob in Jerusalem. Paul built the bridge by reminding them of his own Jewish heritage. He reminded them that he had once detested Jesus and his followers, persecuting them. He explained the process by which he had changed his mind and joined the movement that he once opposed. And what was the result? The community was already at a fever pitch. The crowd erupted violently, demanding Paul's death. Next up in Acts 26, which we just studied, we see high officials in the Roman court. Paul describes his religious heritage. He related his view of his opponent's charges against him. He recalls his previous opposition to Jewish uh, Jesus followers. He recounted his personal life-changing encounter with Christ, and he explained the fundamentals of Jesus' message and the implications for his non-Jewish listeners. And the result? The rulers listened carefully. They challenged his application of the gospel to them. They passed him on to the Roman judicial process, foiling the Jewish plot against him. So we see that the gospel itself is forever the same. But as Christ followers, we are called to shape our message to fit our various audiences. What aspects of the good news would they most likely respond to? Do you know how they view faith now? If not, why not ask them before you speak? As far as Jesus, we have a lifetime of God moments, and we are called to share them with other people in humility. What an awesome privilege we have been given to participate in the bringing of the kingdom of heaven to earth now. This year's study theme centers on our unstoppable God and his irresistible message that is fueled by his unstoppable spirit who encourages, equips, and empowers you and me to be unstoppable witnesses to build his unstoppable church. So let's be part of something much bigger than ourselves. Will you begin praying for God to provide opportunities for you to share the gospel in order to influence and impact another generation? God will do the drawing, he does the convicting, and he will transform people's lives. So let our last catchphrase be that of the Duracell energy batteries. <laughs>
we keep on going and going and going and going. So some reflection points for us tonight. What areas of your life do you need to exercise resolve so that you are accountable to God and others? How are you demonstrating faith and calm in the current circumstances? And how often do you look for a more convenient time to share the gospel? So let us pray. Lord, may our, our, may our prayer today be encouraging the encouraging words Paul wrote to Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit and passing along the love that you have shown for each of us, may we be disciplined by faith in you and not fearful of our present circumstances. And may our hope in you encourage others as we lift spirits and point them, point them to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.